Even when you feel low, you can still go Even when you feel slow, you can still go Even when there's no hope, you can still go I never answer to no man, I still go Go, go What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's Pastor Keenan, your hostess with the most. is back with another episode of People Suck, Love Them Anyways. We're in today with our favorite sidekick, Nick. Nick, what's happening, man? Bring me that energy like you normally do. Everything's great. Everything's awesome. You know, like the Lego movie says, everything is awesome. You know, we're excited. Oh, we're excited. man. You know, I, I'm not even really... Uh, I'm kind of impressed a little bit. I feel I like mean, maybe f- if I didn't keep a straight face the whole time. I was gonna say know. I felt like you faked it just yeah. a little bit. Did you? Uh, maybe. Okay. It's fine. All right. Hey, man, you got to fake it till you make it. That's the way it is. And uh, again, it's another episode. If people suck. Love them anyways. Thank you guys for tuning in. And as you know, every single week we've been doing a different guest. We've been trying to take some people from different walks of life and uh, just really try to relate uh, biblical principles and what goes on within church to real life stuff and how people deal with stuff every single day. Uh, and today we have our residential Jesus, is what we call him, and <laughs> the residential Jesus. Amen, right? amen. <laughs> he literally just fed five thousand before he walked in here and got on this podcast <laughs> with us. So today we have Robert Roby. Roby, how you doing, bro? Doing pretty well. Been a good day. Weather's a little. A little sad out there. A little but, uh, suspect, I yeah, call him, man. Yeah, yeah. Happy so. to be here, though. Happy oh, to be here. Absolutely, man. So, uh, Rob, man, he, he has gone to school uh, longer than Moses. Uh, he, he has been in, uh, he's been in school for a long time, man. Got multiple degrees. Uh, and now he is in a profession that people love to hate and hate to love. Uh, he gets to shape and craft young minds every single day. Rob, tell me, where do you teach? What grade level you teach, and what is the most rewarding thing about your job? Well, I uh, teach at Bernheim Middle School. Mm-hmm. I teach 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, so I see all the middle schoolers. Most rewarding part of my job is just probably that it's a service-based industry. Right. Uh, you just get that opportunity to really form those relationships with, like you said, the, the young minds. Yeah. And so um, despite all the hecticness and all the uh, craziness that goes through a classroom, I think you, you normally come out of the day with a, with a feeling of a accomplishment right um and and that's a daily feeling and um you know i I think some people in certain professions feel like that is void in their life right and and so i'm just happy to uh feel like i'm making a difference Uh, i feel like that was a jesus answer was that a jesus (laughs) answer what do you think man i feel like it was pretty good so uh yeah today's episode we're going to be talking about connecting with the crowd uh connecting with the crowd and and how important it is to connect with the crowd uh you know in your church connect with the crowd uh you know as a pastor myself preaching the message knowing the people knowing the sheep um knowing your crowd that's within the church with you the circle that's there and also uh you know we're going to flip that and take it to like you know rob teaching in the classroom and how important it is to know his students and know what they're going through and how to really put all of that together and I'll be honest with you. I was like thinking about Bible verses and stuff, and and verses never really hit me as much as what stories did uh, with Jesus, man. It seems like wherever right, Jesus right. went, there was a crowd. There was a crowd going on here and there. Like crowds followed Jesus, and it seems like he would always connect with the crowd in some way, somehow, some shape, form, or fashion. And so, you know, connecting with that crowd uh, is so important. Uh, first off, you know, we'll talk about and we'll flip the script, go both ways right here. But how important is it to know? Let's just say the landscape of the crowd. Who's in the crowd, uh, and 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 maybe their backgrounds. So how, how important? Uh, we'll go from a teaching aspect first, Rob. How 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 important is it to know? Let's just say your kids' background, man, and and so and how does that change up your style of teaching? Right. Uh- The tighter relationship you can form with those kids, the better chance and opportunity you have to actually make that difference in their lives. A student that doesn't like you or feel like they know or understand you is not interested in hearing what you have to say or doing what you uh, are putting in front of them. Right. And so... uh, to answer the question how important it is to know your audience um well i'll say the first couple days in class we barely even get into any content you know we're we're looking at community building activities i'm not only trying to figure out who my kids are i'm also trying to figure out who they are in relation to each other Mm. because every class has just such a different dynamic i can take the same lesson plan and i can feed that to five different classes and each class is going to come out of it with a different perspective absolutely and so really just understanding how that dynamic is going to play out is so important yeah uh 
Uh, and especially in the middle school world, you know, these kids, they want you to know what they're interested in, you right. know? Yeah. Uh, it, it, I can't remember every single thing that, that they tell me, but, you know, it, it, if I could... I would know the names of their dogs and cats. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. right yeah. I would know their family history. Right. I would know their favorite color, their favorite yeah. songs. Yeah. And, um, you know, I try to make sure um, that I include activities where they got an opportunity to express themselves. Right. Um, so, you know, we, we, we do a lot of things. You know, I'll ask the kids, well, what, what's the last movie you watched? Yeah. What's the last song you listened right. to? You know, right. just giving them a chance. Even if I'm not genuinely um, – interested in you know remembering all that or, mm-hmm. or going and listening to the same music that they're listening to at least it lets them know that i do care absolutely man i like that nick he said community man and to me community is based on and a root word of communication and uh as he's talking about doing this communication talking to kids opening up things like that how important is it within a church atmosphere uh, and aspect is it that you know when we, when we preach about this all the time like before we we can go help the lost person in the streets we got to know the person in our pew you know like we got to talk to the people in our pews and get to know them and and build community through that way so how important is it as jesus done in so many times to build that community and that and that communication uh in the crowd Mm -hmm. yeah it's extremely important to actually communicate with the people around you because you know as we've talked about before in different episodes you know how how important it is for you to share your testimony so that way, you know, if, if someone comes up to you, you know, as a, as a pastor and saying, hey, I'm really struggling with alcoholism, right. you know, because you've communicated with other people in the church, you're going to be able to point out someone who's also dealt with alcoholism, but yeah. Jesus is freed from that. Right. And so, you know, you're going to be like, hey, go talk to this person over here. They'll help encourage you. They'll mm-hmm. help show what worked for them, what didn't work for them. Mm-hmm. They're going to be able to give you much more, um, you know, just concrete and relevant information than I would be able to because you know right. you may never you may have never struggled with alcoholism. Yeah. yeah, yeah you don't yeah. know how to help right. that person through I can't that. speak to what I've not struggled with. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah. so you know sometimes it's best to point them in the direction of yeah. somebody who has dealt with that before. Which is why it's so important to communicate those problems, those things that we've been through, those things that we've experienced, because if we don't communicate that within the church, then we're not going to be able to help those people who walk through the door with different issues because we don't know where to point them to. We're kind of coming up with a uh, you know an almost false sense of empathy just saying, hey I kind of understand you know I, I was reading it in a book uh, just last night you know it's when when somebody comes to you and says hey my family died sometimes we try to relate to them by saying yeah i had a cat that died once i kind of understand what you're feeling i preached about that bro yeah. <laughs> you right. did too i know yeah that's, that's what fine. it hey, give the it's book fine, credit yeah. but not the pa- fine, whatever man I got um, you. but you know again just understanding that yeah. you know that is something that people deal with you know on a basis you know on a regular everyday basis especially in a church setting a school setting a work setting you know there are things that you have not experienced you have not dealt with and so you have to go seek the counsel of somebody who has absolutely and rob with him talking about influence he was talking about you know we're gonna uh you know it's important to engage in in conversation so that way we know uh you know maybe who we can put somebody else under to get them kind of going in the right direction influence man who was somebody that influenced you as far as teaching maybe it was a professor in college maybe as a high school teacher whatever but who was somebody that you really kind of like that you got up underneath their wing you know what I'm saying? And like you were like, man, this is this is what inspires you to do what you do. Um, well, you know, honestly, I could list a, a, a ton of people in reference to that. Um, I will say I had a, a professor and uh, he, he had been at a lot of big universities and, and whatnot, but he had decided to uh, move back home. He's from Kentucky. He mm-hmm. actually uh, lives right across the LaRue County border, and he, and he's still a professor up at uh, ECTC right mm-hmm. now. Yeah. And so... Um, you talking about the dude that was in The Shining? I wanted to, but, <laughs> but, but I'm Man. not. Uh, Sorry. I, I, now, I will say I know him very well. <laughs> okay. He's wrote me letters of recommendation. Uh, hey, hey. Uh, shout out to your old Danny Lloyd. Hey, there I, you I, go. And I don't know if you all know, he actually had a cameo in um, uh, what was the sequel they just really it did it didn't get any kind of the notoriety that The Shining did, <laughs> Dr. but uh, Sleep or something like Do- that. Sleep, okay, yeah, yeah. Doctor Sleep. He he got a cameo in that. That's cool. Um, w- which is funny because he does not want you to to talk about that. Oh, movie I've heard in that. Class. I have yeah, heard that. Which we can go on about that all right, day. Right. But no, actually, um, in the same department as him, there there there's a guy named um, 
Joe Wolf, uh-huh. and uh, like I said, he he's he's had a very successful career, professor in microbiology. So you know he's produced research and stuff. He decides to step down into this community college setting right. um, to focus more on the community aspect of teaching. You know, at those bigger universities, a professor can only do so much to actually engage with their students because so much of their job entails that they're producing research right. uh, and, and, and doing all that type of stuff and. And I don't know what made this man so different other than the fact that every time he stepped into the classroom, he was uh, it was showtime for him. I mean, he was ready to engage with you. He was willing to, to hear you out. And I can go on and on about different professors, different teachers that did amazing things. Yeah. But can I tell you, one of the most amazing things that this guy did, when you sent him an email, he got back uh, to you sometimes yes. within four or five minutes. <laughs> I, was like, through. I was like, is this email or is this text message? <laughs> yeah, automatic um, reply. What is this? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I I don't think he, he ever left a student feeling like they were in the void Man, uh, or, or that they didn't have the support. Yeah. You know, I, I tried to put myself in a position where I was successful in his classroom, obviously, but I, I felt like if I had not been, he would have figured out a way to get me there. Right, right. And so uh, just to know that his priority was us made, yeah. made all the difference. Absolutely. So Rob just hit something, availability, Nick. Uh, you know, how big is availability whenever you're talking about, you know, just uh, being available. I know we were just joking about, you know, phones being on silent and everything else for the most part. But uh, and I admit, man, I'm a sucky person whenever it comes to answering phone calls and stuff like that, for sure. Uh, But availability is big, man, in community and in things like that. Availability is uh, I think he said, you know, that no student was left in the void, you know, and uh, and, you know, I think like, you know, I think Rob would attest to the fact of that, you know, you can teach a kid as much as you want to, but until they want to learn, you know what I'm saying? But you still have to make it uh, available to them, right? And, uh, you know, with that regard, uh, but how much is it uh, an aspect of availability important with, you know, just community and just acknowledging who's in the crowd, man? Yeah, I think availability kind of goes hand in hand with re- reliability. Yeah. Um, you know, because if you're available, then that helps someone understand that you they, they can rely on you, you know, because mm-hmm. it's it's kind of, it also falls in line with like accountability. Right. Um, you know, all those illity words. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, kind of like bro. connecting together there. I still need that uh, the source, by the way. Right, I know. We'll get it to you one of these days. okay uh right. maybe next christmas but um <laughs> so you know i think it's very important to be able to to be available you know as a as a leader as you know uh, as a pastor as a teacher as a community leader whatever right. you know whatever you are even as just a a father to your children you know or a mother to your children you know mm-hmm. availability is important because you know you want to make sure that those those people that are under you those people who are beside you those people can you know they can contact you at any time and say hey i'm dealing with this i'm struggling with this i know that you've helped me before i need your you know wisdom I need your knowledge. I need your love, your care, your empathy, sympathy, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, you know, we that you want to have that availability because if you don't, then people aren't going to reach out to you and they're not going to grow in a way that maybe they need to. Yeah. You know, if, if you're called to be, you know, available, then you need to make sure that, you know, you are available. Um, you know, don't have your phone on silent anymore, Keenan. You know, we, we need to make sure that people can reach you if they we need to. We ain't even something. church, man. Come right? on. I know. Come We're on. Somewhere. Uh, but again, Availability is just very important because, again, it's important to know that, hey, this person that I rely on, I can rely on them. I can contact Mm -hmm. them. They're going to reach out to me. They're going to help me with what I'm dealing with, what I'm struggling with, whatever it may be. You know, as a from a from a teaching standpoint, you know, you want to be you know available for your students because you know they they sometimes don't have the resources at home that are you know they're going to be able to help them out. You know, I mean, I've been in education settings before. Rob and I have talked about it before. You know, like you know, there's a lot of students out there who who don't have supportive parents, who don't have a support system at home. Yeah. You know, so if they need something, if they have a problem, there are people at school, they may be their only safe person that they can turn to. True. You know, the only person that's available to them, the only person that they can rely on may be that teacher, may be that pastor at church, may be that, you know, person at McDonald's that they talk to right, every time they right, go in there. Right. You know, it, it, it sometimes, you know, I think it looks different for everybody, but, you know, I think sometimes we can also forget how important we are to some other people. Uh-huh. Um, you know, we, we may think that we're not all that important, but to our kids, we may be king of the universe. You know, right, to, right. to the kids in a classroom, yeah. we may be the only person they have that they can turn to and talk to. Right. Um, or trust or rely on and all these sorts of things. So availability is important because, you know, we have to be out there to help people. Mm-hmm. If we're not available, then we can't help other people. We can't guide other people. We can't provide wisdom, insight, whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, so I think availability is really important for a lot of different reasons. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And you put, you brought up a, a scenario right there where we talked about moms and dads and we talked about, I want to talk about the family aspect just for a little bit because 
Um, you know, in, in teaching, Rob, sometimes you might have to be the dad to somebody. Sometimes you might have to be, uh, you know, that, that mom figure to show love and grace and care. Sometimes you might have to be that dad figure to show, you know, to be stern and, and to be, you know, uh, to, to, to put some, some structure in somebody's life, you know. Um, and uh, I, I think once you, and, and you can speak to this, once you get to know your crowd and you get to know, you know, you, you, this in this instance, your group of kids, man, you know, you kind of start to fill out the aspects of what you need to be in their lives, right, at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, much like a, a, a lot of professions out there, uh, if you're looking to get into teaching just to, to fill the void of, of a career, I would suggest that you step right back out the door and go <laughs> go find something that— Go uh, collect carts at Walmart. They yeah, need those people, yeah. man. Because uh, you can make the, the money doing something, you know, maybe a little more— um, mundane to, right. to, to use yeah. a word but um when, when, when you embrace the uh teaching profession you got to treat it like a calling you know right. uh what goes on in that classroom is is just a small fraction of what yeah. what being a teacher actually is you know um like you said there, there are kids out there when, when they go home the only way or the only incentive that they're going to come to school is themselves. You right. know, they don't yeah. have any anybody monitoring their progress or success. And so, you know, as a teacher, you got to be dedicated to not only teaching the kids what you want to teach them, but also developing a mindset within them that they're uh, dedicated to themselves, mm -hmm. not just yeah. what ever work you're putting in right, front of them right. and so you really see it in some kids where they're they're coming into some of these classrooms and these are typically the kids that get the uh you know disciplinary labels you know this is right. either a, a bad kid and you know i try to tell my my kids whenever i have talks with them you know that that are frequently getting in trouble i said you know there's no such thing as as really a bad kid there's just kids that make bad decisions and they're right. making these bad decisions based off the experience Experiences that they've had you right, know right, they're right, not right. just boring wanting to cause havoc right, in other people's right. lives you yeah. know what you know according to the bible we all have a sinful nature right uh and, and we all deal with that in certain ways but you know these kids are products of their environment True. you know um and 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 even in a year of teaching these kids, which, you know, in my position, I teach sixth, seventh and eighth grade. So I may right. see these kids for for a number of years. It's it's truly impossible to know exactly what's going on in their household. Right. And so you've got to be open minded. You got to be flexible because you may know a kid for months and then all of a yeah. sudden they'll hit you with something that just surprises. Right. You. And you're like, OK, yeah. it makes sense. But yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> right. Um, but now, I, you know, I've got kids that. um if it wasn't for their own incentive, they they wouldn't even be making it to high school, yeah, you know, because, yeah. uh, you know, they have a small degree of, of integrity for themselves that's probably been a product of the positive influences that they have, but it's not always the family that's the positive influences. Right. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? Yeah, I agree with that, man. I agree. And, and the first, like, the big word at Nick, is, as Rob was talking, the big word that came out to me was grace. You know, was grace. He was talking about, you know, having that empathy for kids and things like that. And, you know, and, and, and we've always heard the term or I've always heard it. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? It gets the attention. It gets the grease. And but honestly, you know, if we don't have that grace to be able, you know, people people who need help call out for it in different ways. Kind of like what Rob was saying, you know, like it's just like it may be surprised whenever they come to you in three or four weeks and be like, you know, well, this is what's happening. And then you it all starts to make sense. But from that point. It, you know, you're just kind of like, man, like, this is crazy. Why are you acting like this? Why are you being crazy like this? You know, and as Christians, you know, and I mean, uh, you know, we, we've all had our dealings in ministry and things like that. But like, as Christians, how important is it to understand that these people that act out or these people that are, you know, going crazy with their thoughts and emotions and might have been in jail and, and or whatever, like, you know, like at that point, how how important is it to understand that grace is a huge concept that goes along with connecting with the crowd? How, how important? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think grace, you know, I, as he was talking, I was kind of reminded of a situation that I, I would tell uh, some of the kids that I taught about, you know, that, that school bully that always bothers them, that kid who's in the middle of class that's always screaming out and yelling and causing a disruption mm -hmm. and the teacher's always getting on to him and all these sorts of things. Um, you know, a lot of times, and as I was teaching these kids, I said, you know, we may see them as a, an annoyance, somebody who's just being, you know, stupid, silly, right. whatever, yeah. someone's frustrating, right. taking stuff out on them all the time. 
Uh, but what, and I tell the kids this, I'm like, but what you don't realize is that when that kid goes home every day, they don't get any attention. Yeah. You know, maybe they right. go home and their parents are cussing each other out all night or throwing stuff. Maybe their parents are working all night and they're home by themselves. Right. You know, they're not getting attention at home. And that is something that's very, very needed and important in a kid's life as they're growing up and aging and developing. Mm-hmm. And so what they do is sometimes they'll come to school and they'll act out because they get attention. It may not be positive attention, right. but they get attention. You know, yeah. someone is paying attention to them. Someone's calling their name out. Someone is looking at them, laughing at them, whatever it may be. And so they're getting that kind of attention. And so, you know, understanding that sometimes in those situations, it's very easy for us to get mad at them. And, you know, as the, as the podcast says, people suck. You know, we immediately right. say, you know, that yeah. person sucks. Yeah. What they're doing sucks. Yeah, right. You know, it's driving me nuts. It's making me mad, making me frustrated, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Um, it's very, very easy for us to do and say those types of things. But again, once we learn to have empathy and we learn to utilize grace in those situations and understand that this person is a human being who has been through horrible stuff mm-hmm. or maybe maybe they've experienced things that I just can't seem to understand or comprehend. And I need to show them a little grace and give them a little time. And, you know, maybe when I first approach them, I don't get the response that I wanted, but I just have to keep, you know, slowly chiseling away. It's another another kind of metaphor I use with students is that, you know, you want to see people sometimes as like a big block of marble. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it looks just like a big, you know, block. You don't know what to do right. with it. But as you slowly start to chisel away at that block, you can eventually create something beautiful out of it. You can right. create a beautiful relationship, a beautiful friendship, mm-hmm. something that just has sustenance to it, something that looks amazing, you know, but again, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes grace, mercy, right. forgiveness, all that stuff that we talk about every single week. Right. You know, it takes a lot of that to getting to know them and to, to learn them and to deal with what they're dealing with and to be there and sit with them in the, the sucky situations. Um, you know, so it's very important, and again, going back to even reliability and accountability and um, availability, all these sorts of things, because the there are a lot of people in the world that we get frustrated with, but they just need someone in their life to actually show them that they matter. Right. Um, you know, they're out here doing things, you know, and I don't want to get too deep into the psychological side of it, but, you know, they, they do things to try and make up for lack of in their life. Mm. Um, you know, maybe they get in relationships or maybe they, you know, constantly switch jobs or all these different things. You know, they, they do this, but it's important for us as, as Christians, as human beings to sit down with these other people, to learn about them, to get to know them, talk to them, all these sorts of things. If we really want to make an impact and make a change in the world as a whole. Right. I like that. Go ahead, Rob. You see. Yeah, you, you know, as you were talking, Nick, you, you kind of pointed out that, that sometimes there could be a chain reaction with these uh, negative influences in our life. And, and some of these kids that uh, are, are coming from positions of trauma or just coming from positions of lack of support, attention, whatever that may be, right. you know, they may take some of these negative labels they're developing over the years and then see them uh, see see them as a degree of uniqueness. You know, this, yeah. this forms my identity yeah. as opposed to the other kids. And then, you know, if they get too attached to those labels, they, they won't find themselves wanting to detract themselves from right, it. Right, and, right, and, and so if they tell themselves for so long that this negative label is me and they don't have anyone willing to step in and say, wait, buddy, you're so much more than that and you yeah. can be so much more than that, they may never find themselves in a position to dig themselves out of the hole. And and we, we, we think about God, you know. Uh, we know that we, we all know that the song, you know, the reckless love of God. Right. Well, God will leave the ninety nine for the yeah, one. Yeah. And and there's a lot of professions that that need to be willing to do that same thing. And and teaching is one of those professions. Yeah. You know, I I get some some of these kids in here that just feed off some of those negative energies. And uh, I probably get all my straight A students kind of like looking around, like Mister Ropey. When are you going to send this guy yeah, to the office? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, just, just one of my general classroom policies is I'll do everything I can to keep you in my classroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you get these kids attached to these negative images that are used to being in trouble. The more and more they get uh, um, distanced from from the other children, the, the the less likely they are to bridge that gap to right, them. Yeah. And so you get kids that uh, are in and out of trouble, they miss assignments in class. And right. then they realize that if they go to detention, they get to miss another assignment. Right, yeah. So once you send a kid out of your classroom, you're telling them a couple of things. One, you're either mad or disappointed at them right. but you're also telling them that you're kind of giving up on them and yeah. you, you don't have any kind of control or relationship with them, with them to control right, them right. and so you know the second a kid leaves your classroom you've given up a lot of your ability to to reach them mm-hmm. and so if you can show a kid that you're willing to uh drag your feet through the mud 
if they're going to make it a little muddy, but you show them you're willing to drag your feet through the mud and then still come out on the other side, uh, that's whenever you've gone past scratching the surface of relationship and you've done uh, uh, something to actually build a positive image of themselves, you know, that they right. have somebody that, that's willing to just uh, try to be there for them. And, and like I said, you're in many ways, you're leaving the 99 for the one because yeah. some of these kids are um, – uh, are just completely derailing whatever lesson plan you have going on, mm. whatever the class is up to. But but at the end of the day, even those kids that have the straight A's that are wanting to just have this perfect little class, they they see something um, a lot bigger than just content and grades. They right. they see somebody that's uh, willing to care for somebody that um, a lot of other people wouldn't. Right. So let's talk about correction just for a second because. Uh, with correction, you said, Nick, you said chisel, you know, you have to chisel it out. And whenever you said chisel, correction hit in my mind, you know, and, and we thought we talk about God, you know, I mean, like we've, we've always talked about God being gracious, loving, merciful, you know, all that good stuff. But he's also a God who corrects. He loves us enough to correct, to correct us. And a lot of times correction can be painful for i feel like both involved you know i mean i i I think when god reaches down and tries to correct us i mean i think it breaks his heart that we're not where we need to be with him in the process uh and you know i mean of course correction with us hurts sometimes i mean it's we lose things we we have to admit we're wrong we have to get back on the right track you know there's a lot of work that goes in uh goes in with that uh, I want to talk a little bit about correction, but I want to talk about doing it in a loving way because that is something that, like, uh, that that is, you know, correction is not just looking at somebody and saying, you screwed up. You know what I'm saying? But like you said, loving loving somebody, a loving correction is, okay, yes, you messed up, but let's talk about how we get to the next point. How do you get back to this point? How do you get better in the process? And, you know, I mean, that's what God is so good at is getting us back to the to the good points. But, you know, how, how let's just, you know, let's start off with teaching. How do you correct a student or how do you correct, uh, you know, your class or a crowd to where – you know, you, you, you get the dynamic of, you know what, I'm correcting, but I'm also teaching because I love you and I want you to be better. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, at the age that I'm teaching these kids, you know, they're just coming into a, a brand new world. One one is a world full of hormones. Uh, one is a world where they're beginning to see past their, their own realities and they're beginning to realize that everyone around them is living a different reality. Right. And so I think a big part of it is, is just trying to expand that worldview, allowing these kids to see different perspectives. You know, a lot of these kids are coming out of uh, deeply ingrained households where, right. you know, there's one belief system. Yeah. And, and, and of course, hopefully at the end of the day, we're all agreeing on one belief system that that system being jesus right but um you know when, when it comes to the classroom setting you you really want these kids to be able to take a step back from whatever it is they've experienced and, and realize that other people are experiencing things in relation to them as yeah, well absolutely so that they can see there's something a lot bigger to this life yeah than than just getting by right or or just you know trying to get through the day, yeah. you know, uh, you have to develop a sense of dedication to yourself and these kids. You right. know, these kids have to see that they are valuable mm-hmm. and they can be a lot of things. And one of the things that they will come to see is that they don't want to be a disruption. Right. Because being a disruption to other people means that you're a disruption to yourself as well. And so once they can see that there's something a whole lot bigger to this world, I think they'll begin to see that uh, there can be something a whole lot bigger to themselves. Absolutely. So you said, I want to talk about culture because I think that, I think that makes a huge difference. Uh, I want, Nick, I want you to give your opinion. Rob, I want you to give your opinion and then I'll give my opinion and then we'll start trying to work towards the ending of this whole situation here. But we talked about culture, about being the, the, the more cultured you are, uh, you know, Rob was talking about some deeply ingrained backgrounds, uh, you know, and, and, uh, I will say this until the day that I die, man, that hate is taught, you know, hate is taught. Like, you know, as a child, you are taught, you know, to hate somebody or hate a skin color or hate a certain demographic of people or whatever the case is. And I, I'll stand by that. Um, how important is it, Nick, do you think, in your opinion, to be cultured of 
and I'm not talking like just cultured as in like, you know, today's reality uh, of every type of person, situation, music genre, uh, what what's being taught, what's being said. How important is it to have kind of like a little grasp of everything that's going on? You don't have to support it or believe in it or, or whatever, but how important is it to kind of know and stay connected in with culture just to be able to relate to the crowd as well. I think, you know, a lot of us kind of get stuck and we've talked about this time and time again, you know, we get stuck in this black and white mentality as, you know, it's, it's gotta be this way. And if you're not this way, then you're not well, like me with me or you right, know, whatever you're right. against me. If you're not for me, you're against me. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I think, you know, it, as with that mindset, I think it's very hard for some people to try and delve into the other side. You know, uh-huh. it's hard for them to kind of look over and examine what's going on over there. You know, it, it's, you know, I don't, because I'm afraid that if I look over there and I examine what's going on, then my opinion's going to change and I don't want my opinion to change. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's very difficult for us to look over on the other side of the aisle and kind of think about that. But, from a Christian perspective, we are called to love everyone. Right. And, you know, I, we've talked about this before in a podcast, um, I, I think, with, but, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy for us to get stuck in that black or white mentality. But what we don't realize a lot of times is that when we choose one side of the aisle, we are pushing away everyone else on the other side. Right. You know, like if we, and we talked about this before, the world knows what Christianity is against. You know, uh-huh. the world knows that, you know, according to the Bible, this is a sin, this is right, a sin, this right, is a sin, right, you know, all those right, sorts of things. Right. Um, but, you know, there, there are certain situations that create difficulties because we're like, if I take a stance on this, then I am basically pushing away people who don't agree with that stance. Mm-hmm, yeah. And, you know, if I push those people away, how am I ever going to bring those people into the fold of Christ? Right. How am I ever going to bring those people into the kingdom of God? Right. You know, I think we use the illustration. Um, I think uh, Andy Stanley had mentioned it in a book that I'd read of his, but, you know, he was talking about specifically the the uh, church shutdowns and all that that were coming along with COVID. Yeah. And he was talking about, and I said, it, it kind of clicked for me in a way that I hadn't thought about it before, but, you know, he was talking about, you know, if, if I had shut the church or if I had kept the church open, this uh-huh. was his, his, his idea was if I had kept the church open, then what it would have done is it would have further pushed away all of the people who were wanted the churches to close, right. who were you know worried about public safety, who were yeah. worried about this right. and the other. Right. So like he's like, if I kept the church open, I would be pushing away the very people I'm trying to save. Right. And I think in his mentality was that, and so he took a stance that was controversial um, to a lot of people at the time. Right. It's still a controversial right. to a lot of yeah. people. Um, but he took that stance under the guise of. I don't want to push people further away than they already are. Right. And because we saw that, you know, we yeah. saw a division that happened right. as a result of, yeah. you know, churches shutting down, COVID, all, all these sorts of different things. Yeah. And, you know, there there are a lot of people out there, you know, again, you could say, you know, this certain group of people, you know, if we wanted to stereotype, you know, this certain group of people, the group of people that wanted churches to shut down were Democrats. Again, this is not accurate, but, you know, just throwing right. this out yeah, there. I you know, if you. we said, you know, if we wanted, if Democrats wanted the churches to shut down, um, but Republicans, a lot of them would say the Democrats are the ones that need to get saved. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? right, But we're right. sitting here pushing, you know, they're pushing these people away further and further away. And uh, so absolutely. I think it's important to kind of put yourselves in the shoes of these other people, try to kind of dabble in mm-hmm. what they're dealing with, what they're struggling with, what their mentality is. Mm-hmm. I remember having a conversation with a, with a girl I dated a long time ago um, just about the issue of uh, gun control. And again, I know this isn't kind of, but it's kind of related. Just stay with me for a second. Well, it's culture. Um, right, exactly. It's culture. Um, so she was, she was um, you know, someone that you would consider, you know, a more liberal person, more democratic person. Mm-hmm. Um, but she didn't understand why she, in her mind, had been taught for so long that people wanted to open carry firearms because they wanted to shoot someone. Right. Like this was an actual thought that crossed her mind that yeah. has been shared amongst a lot of her friends is that people, you know, carried or concealed carried because they were always waiting for the day someone would come into a store and they could shoot them. Right. Like this was their actual mentality. Yeah. And I had to explain to her, I said, you know, when people conceal carry or even open carry, I said, they're not hoping that someone's going to come in. Right. But wouldn't you feel a little bit safer with someone with your best interest and everyone else in that restaurant's best interest in mind if a crazy person did come in and was mm-hmm. like, hey, I want to hurt everyone in here? Mm-hmm. Like if a disgruntled employee came in and was going to shoot up the place because they were mad at Steak and Shake cut their hours? Mm-hmm. Like you said, I, I would personally feel a little bit safer knowing at least there's something there I could protect you with. Yeah. And steak, like, and, steak and Shake's always right, iron, I know, exactly. Way, and it's a little scary in there, too. But, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. But go ahead. But again, yeah, I think it's just... They ain't again, cut nobody's was, hours. And, <laughs> 
in her head, and in, in her head, when I said that, it clicked. She's like, "I never really thought about that boat before." Yeah, you know, it's like, I, I'd always thought that it was this way, and mm. I didn't ever want to think about it this other way. Mm. And so, you know, I think you know, just from this whole rant here, what I want people to do is, I just want people to open their minds a little bit. Again, it doesn't mean you have to change your opinions. It doesn't mean you have to change your belief system right. or all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But if we really want to show love to the world, we sometimes have to see what they're dealing with. We have to get oh, in yeah. the suck with them. We have right. to deal with what they're dealing with a little bit, kind of get to know them, get to know what they're struggling with. Because mm-hmm. if we don't, we're just going to be pushing those people further and further and further away. If we choose right. one side over the other, you know, I think it's like someone was talking before that, like, you know, I've, I've heard the statement, like, you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat. Um, you know, and it's so crazy to think about that mindset, you know, yeah. I, and cause I mean, it's just like, you know, what, 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 why, why not? <laughs> like, yeah, why not? Yeah, like, right, I right. mean, we like, you know, there are Republican candidates that support things that are ungodly. There are yeah. Democratic candidates that support right. things that are ungodly. Yeah, right, right. Like if you choose, and we, we've gotten on a rant about this before, but if you choose any one of the political spectrums, you're going to be making someone mad. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you, yeah, even, absolutely. you even take that one step further. What, what happens if you don't live in America? You're yeah. not part of the exactly. two party system. <laughs> like, you know, if you are a Republican, unsafe. you're not yeah. a I don't care if you're in India or wherever you're at. Yeah. Uh, Before Rob jumps in and and throws his opinion in on the culture topic, uh, you know, you you talked about Stanley, man, and he made a he made a huge comment the other day uh, about about uh, homosexuals and and you know and just the you know the gay community, and he said you know he said honestly he said if the he said if the gay community still even feels welcome to come to church he said honestly i think they're performing and practicing more faith sometimes than what normal christians are because the church has been horrible to them you know and i'm like you know that's that's a strong stance to take you know uh, along the way but at the same point in time going back to what you were saying about love and stuff it's like you know if we ever want people to get better regardless we have to be able to accept them for as they are who they are where they are and say God, it's in your hands, you know, regardless. So, Rob, man, how important is being a little bit cultured or knowing what's up in culture, knowing what's up in everyday life? How important is that, man, to be able to relate to the crowd that you connect with, that you teach with, or that you're that you're even friends with or in the church itself? You know, go ahead, bro. You got all the time in the world. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Everything we do is weird to somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, no, no matter how ingrained you are to your own community, if you take a step back, you are going to uh, live a different life than somebody. And, and there yeah. again, hopefully Jesus is, is just a point in, in this world that no matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, we mm-hmm. can come to agreements on that. Right. And then if we can start with that relationship, we can begin to branch out just to overcome some of those cultural boundaries. Right. You know, um, I read an article one time, and that's actually what what I was kind of glancing at. Yeah, uh, this was actually for for college anthropology class. This anthropology is just you know study of of human life, right? Right. study of culture and stuff yeah. like that. We'll get your and dictionary then, for that one. Too. I know, man. <laughs> like, y'all throwing out these ten dollar words uh, on I me, know, man. I know. Gosh, uh, but. Uh, you know, I kind of pulled it up. I'm not going to read it just because it is a little longer. But we read this like the first day of class, and it was it was pretty interesting. It was about a a, a culture of people called the Nasarima. You know, they live somewhere between the Copper Canyons of Mexico and like the Northern Rockies or something like that. And it was just <laughs> I need a geographic map. <laughs> God, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. I ain't doing no more of this, man. Like, you, you, and to think Keenan was going to be a teacher. One I know, day. right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was teaching little kids, and not like this stuff. You know, but you, you can come ahead. visit the classroom. Bro, I appreciate it, bro. I need, I need it. I needed it. But we got this culture, the Nasarima, and and this anthropologist has you know studied them, whatever. Going to write this article on them. Mm-hmm. You find some really weird things that they do. You know, they start out their day by uh, bowing down to to a shrine, which is kind of also it's like a fountain that you make. It's just part of their their culture that they do. And the first bite that they take for the day they spit it out to uh you know sort of like a sacrifice right yeah. is what it appears to, yeah. to the outsiders and then from there they they, they just kind of go on with their day um i'm talking do talking they, to, I'm do, talking about us. Do they, so, do they uh, spit it in the floor? I mean, where do they spit it? They at? spit it know. into the shrine oh, that they, they bow into they, the fountain. They, they bow their head down for two minutes at this shrine 
spitting this first bite of the day out. And and this if you insane. if you spell Nasarima backwards, it's America. Oh, see, and, <laughs> see. And, and so I'm talking about I'm talking about a bathroom sink and yeah. brushing our teeth. Okay, but to the outsider, that's a very weird act to somebody that's never brushed their teeth before. Yeah, you, normally you get people studying cultures the the opposite way. You got yeah. this big you know big wig going into the jungle to to study these primitive people. But if you take somebody out of that jungle and they try to see what we're doing, right? We're the oddballs, you know. Yeah. What are we doing at this sink every morning, just swishing stuff around in their mouth, spitting it out? Kind of like Crocodile Dundee when he came to America, you know? What I'm Absolutely. Saying? All right, yeah. I'm with you now. See, you that's should... not a knife. Yeah, yeah, this is a knife. This is a knife. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm with you now, bro. Go ahead. I'm with you. Um. So, anyways, you you know, I it all goes back to that Tower of Babylon, baby. You yeah. know, um. There are certain barriers that God has in place in this world just to show us how wrong we can be when we come to find Christ. Right. When we come to find Christ, we have to be willing to start detracting from those things that have just held us into, uh, uh, you know, narrow minded mindsets, mm-hmm. you know, a whole, the whole time, you know. I know just some very awesome people out there, but they're like, they're just like one of them you know livestock that's just stuck in that trench that you can't get out the right. only thing you can look at is look forward and when somebody puts slop in front of you you'll eat it right up right never thinking what's over that fence yeah and, and to me jesus is really that guy that's going to lift you up over that fence to get you into the greener pastures the bigger pastures mm. to start to see there's just so much more to this thing yeah um you know, I, I could really go on and on about this so much because culture is just such a, you know, such a big thing. It is. But, uh, you know, just just coming from where we're at in the world, you know, we uh, minister to people primarily in rural Kentucky. Yeah. We're not the most open-minded people. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm glad you said it. I am sorry I'm glad to you say. Said it. <laughs> you know, just thinking about the idea of 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 language. You know, back to the Tower of Babylon. Uh, language is one of the barriers that disconnects people from all across. We hear somebody speaking another language. Sometime we just assume they don't know nothing about the world. Right, right. And it, it, it's just a sad way to be. But um. You know, here in America, we have so many things going for us, so many blessings that have uh, been bestowed on this country, but we also have a lot of challenges. Mm. Yes, we are a melting pot, but we're also the only uh, monolingual country out there, you know, just a a country where people are expected to only speak one language. And and so what kind of barriers does that put on in our life that, that, you know, we just don't have the same type of exposure to difference as a lot of other people do, you know, especially Mm -hmm. being in rural Kentucky. It might be different if you live in New York or, you know, L.A. or something like that. You go see some crazy stuff in L.A. (laughs) (laughs) I just got some flashbacks from from our honeymoon. But, um, you know, anyways, I just think with our position as ministers, we we really have to have to hit that point. And and we know that you've talked about it in a lot of your sermons, Keenan. Reaching people is 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 really about connecting people, you know. And and you can't connect people when when they have all these barriers that they placed up that they're not willing to break down, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, man. That is true. And and I appreciate both viewpoints. I mean, I think there's definitely some some great stuff said, and uh, I don't. I mean, my viewpoint is is really a, an intermix of both. You know, I mean, I, I truly think that, like you said, to, to connect people, that's what it's all about, and we have to be able to know a little bit about culture and other cultures, and 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 how other people do things, and how other people think, and how other people see. And you know, I've always said this about our church and about you know the ministry and stuff is that we're about building bridges. You know, and 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 in order to you know in order to connect we have to have conversations and we have to learn people and you know and and there's you know as as being in ministry and seeing things uh what the biggest thing i've had to learn man is the fact of that like not everybody's gonna do it like me see it like me be like me think like me you know and and like you know i have to step back from that and be like you know what like 
just because it's not like me or think like me or do like me doesn't mean it's wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Like, you know, people have different viewpoints, different aspects of their life. Uh, and, and you know what? I mean, like, that's that's just it. Like, you know, but we were all called to, you know, to exist, number one. Number two, um, you know, Jesus said, you know, you'll be known by what? You know, uh, the love you have for me and the love you have for each other, you know? And honestly, if we don't have that love for each other, how can we even sit there and say, you know, we have that love for Jesus, you know, like that's just my thing right off the bat, you know, and it's like, so that's why, man, I've just tried myself, you know, over the last, uh, just, I, I would say probably 24 months at least just to be able just to say, you know what, like, uh, I, I've got to work on me, you know, like I can't be out here trying to quote unquote fix, like, you know, anybody, everybody, it's not even about that. Like I got to work on me in order to be better to, to, to understand people, you know what I'm saying? And to, and to minister and to understand and to open up ears and open up eyes and, and, and just to understand, man, that people are from a different walk, people from a different, you know, different area and, and they may have some different viewpoints, but like you said in the beginning, you know, the centrality of all of this is Jesus. And if we can agree on that, then, you know, the rest of it, man, is stuff that, that we can work out along the way or whatever, or just say we agree to disagree or whatever the case is. So, um, any final thoughts, man, we'll work our way around the table really quick uh nick any final thoughts man no just uh, i mean one of the things that was hitting me you know as i was kind of reading through the bible this uh this week you know is that you know jesus spoke in parables because he want you know he kind of spoke in a way that the people of the time would understand correct um you know and i think that's one way that we need to start emulating is you know we need to try and meet people where they're at you know yeah. i remember when i went to classrooms you know i would wear uh, you know, everybody would think, you know, you wear this, you know, business casual outfit to go teach the classrooms. No, right. I wore an anime T-shirt, movie T-shirts, video game T-shirts, because these kids would see that and lock onto it and immediately like, this is someone I can talk to. This is someone I can relate to. This is someone I can un- that understands me and what I like. And, you know, sometimes we have to be willing to just get down and meet people where they're at uh, in order to really change things or to, to move people's hearts towards Jesus or to show them what love um, and acceptance and understanding truly actually looks like. You know, we get so busy sometimes and just pushing other people's ideas and thoughts and opinions away and telling them they're wrong and stupid and evil and whatever else you may want to call it. Right. Um, but we don't spend enough time getting to know our neighbors, getting to know the people in our pew, getting to know the people in our classrooms, getting to know the people in our businesses and communities mm-hmm. and all those sorts of things. You know, we, we, we're so quick to get on social media and judge people millions and thousands of miles away from right. us. And we, we're so quick to look over at the person who shows up to church late and judge them. Right. Um, but, you know, we're, we're very, we, we don't take enough enough time to look at ourselves to look at the person right next to us to look at the people we spend the most time with to talk to them to get to know them to to speak in a way that they understand and they can relate to you know it takes a lot to do that i understand that right. but it is so so important if we're going to build the kingdom of god it's so so important if we're going to show people what jesus's love actually looks and feels like so it's just important to make sure that we take the time and the um the passion and we do that we empathize with people we get to know them we get to understand them and we meet them where they're at if we ever want to see good things happen in this world absolutely rob any final thoughts man before we go you you know in a world where you can be anything just be kind (laughs) just be a good person he dropped it he dropped a pinterest (laughs) on us man that sounds like a t-shirt somewhere yeah yeah yeah, bro you you know i i kind of getting out of the the teaching frame of mind the way this direction is going i'm kind of getting into the chaplain mode but i'll i'll save that for round two you talk about (laughs) right being a chaplain or whatever that's a whole nother Uh, set of problems bro yeah when i get out of the class on friday i go clock is a chaplain but yeah uh, yeah, yeah hey, it's rewarding it it's is rewarding. it is but uh no in a world where you can be anything be kind you know yeah. it, it's one thing if we can build up a next generation that's going to be successful financially that's going to be uh you know um whatever but uh if the world's falling apart and people just can't have uh get along and have civil discourse you know what are we even shooting for what right. is the end game here what right. how, how are we even defining success because i think you got to redefine success if, if success is what's going on in the world today right, yeah. you know we're in one of the uh, most economically successful times in history you mm-hmm. know we have access to so many things that have improved standard of living but at, mm-hmm. at the same time we have detracted from our ability to connect to each other what we're doing right now is something that doesn't exist for a lot of people when that's civil discourse the ability right. to talk the ability to communicate and uh, you know 
it's just a really weird time time in history that that we've put ourselves in this type of position. Everything is just so polarized. Everything is just all about, uh, you know, I would rather win the argument than win your heart over to be True here statement. to have a yeah. positive True relationship. Right. So. You know, I'll leave it at that. In the world, you can be anything. Be kind, because because we're richer than than anyone was. You know, a thousand years ago. Yeah. Sometimes even even the person that doesn't have a lot today right. has a lot compared to the the, the last two thousand years of right. human history. We've came a long way uh, in terms of that success, but we really have detracted in our ability to connect and reach out to each other. Absolutely. Well, young gentlemen, I appreciate you very much for being on the show today, and uh, thank. Thank you to every each each and every person that, that downloads this and uh, tells their friends and their family about it. We appreciate the support so much. Uh, stepping into different countries and different states every single day, and uh, very proud of that. Very thankful for that. So uh, we love you guys. We appreciate you guys. And until we see you again, man, people suck, but love them anyways. Even when you feel low, you can still go. Even when you feel slow, you can still go. Even when there's no hope, you can still go. I never answered a no, man. I still go. 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 Thank you to everyone for listening to the People Suck But Love Them Anyways podcast. As always, you can check us out on Facebook at Fruition Church, YouTube at Fruition Church of Hodgenville, and check out our website at www.fruitionchurchky.org. Remember, don't suck and love people. Even when you feel low, you can still go. Even when you feel slow, you can still go. Even when there's no hope, you can still go. I never answered a no, man, I still go. Go. go.